So you are getting here on this panel the uh, RBC faculty, as, as Barry Cooper mentioned, along with one of our Australian friends, Mr. Bingham. So I have Dr. Dudrick here, and uh, teaches New Testament for us, brand new to us this year. We have Professor Salang Sang next to him, who is actually one of our own, an alum who went off to seminary and we brought him back. Uh, our favorite Australian, Mr. Bingham. We have Dr. John Tweedale. Some of you might have heard his seminar, and you have a chance to hear his next. And then last, but certainly not least, is our theologian, Dr. Keith Matheson. Well, we have a number of questions for them, so we're going to get started. And the first question is this. Why is this question, the theme of the conference, who am I, why is this question so important? Uh, don't all answer at once. I mean, I'll, I'll go first. That's fine. Um, in one sense, it's one of the first uh, set of questions that the Bible actually begins to answer, as you kind of mentioned this morning, is that who are we? Uh, we're made in the image of God, and that means we have a certain kind of uh, commission as God's image. And so part of what we are created for is for those specific things that's mentioned there in Genesis 1 through 3. It's, it's also important because we are being pummeled by uh, understandings of who we are all over the place every day. You're being told by some that you're just a slightly higher evolved animal. Um, we're, we're told that, we're told all kinds of things. We're, we're, if you're into, if you've read any New Age stuff or encountered that, you're told who you are as a human being, something different from that. And you have all these conflicting messages that are contrary to what Scripture teaches us, that we are human beings created in the image of God. And so knowing who we are, being able to understand that in light of all these conflicting messages is enormously important. It's also important, second, uh, because of the incarnation, who Jesus is. If However we're defining human beings impacts how we understand Christ and his work of salvation. This question, as mentioned in creation and in this present life, uh, also has eternal consequences. Who you are, whether you are a Christian or you don't belong to Christ and you are an unbeliever, has eternal consequences. There is no more beautiful, no more important identity than to be a Christian. And I encourage you to look in the Heidelberg Catechism as mentioned earlier. It defines for you in a beautiful way to summarize what it means to be a Christian. And in short, it's to belong to Christ. And to belong to Christ is to have the assurance of eternal life with him and with God's people. And so this is an internal question got a question for each one of you. So we'll just go right down the line here. Uh, Dr. Dudrick, you've done extensive work on the, the book of Jeremiah and your doctoral studies. But we're going to put a little twist on it, though. Uh, what have you learned about Jeremiah the person as you studied the book of Jeremiah in terms of this question of who am I and some of the things that were in Jeremiah's life? Uh, well, one of the things that kind of strikes me when I think about Jeremiah the person is that he had an incredibly difficult commission before the Lord in terms of his office as a prophet. Uh, he was dealing with a people of God who were very idolatrous, very compromised, uh, and they didn't simply wake up one day and decide to be idolatrous, but many of the things that uh, tr uh, throw them into idolatry is that they are, since trying to be pragmatic uh, in their context of social and economic hardship. And so either kind of embracing other countries, uh, worshiping other, idol uh, other idols or for the sake of economic or social gain. And it really there's kind of a similar kind of situation that the Apostle John was also fighting against in the early church. That's why actually he uses so much of Jeremiah's preaching in his own articulation of the vision that he received. And I think about the emerging generation, and it's actually known by many people who study uh, social uh, things that the emerging generation is drawn to a more pragmatism in their own life. And so keeping that in mind that the preaching of Jeremiah reminds us that uh, in the flesh we are idolatrous sinners drawn to the promises of pragmatism. And so we need to be reminded who we are in Christ, 
Uh, that is, we in Christ, who has been seated at God's right hand, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so if all things have been subjected to his feet, uh, we don't need to be negotiating with a defeated enemy. Uh, we have everything that we need, everything that we uh, desire in Christ. And so we don't need to be pragmatic. We don't need to negotiate. We, there's nothing for us to gain uh, by the surrounding culture. For you, Professor Selang Sang, you've studied friendship, theologically studied friendship. Uh, what are the highlights you could share that could help these teenagers with us today uh, understand this concept of friendship and what true friendship uh, really is? Well, I love friendship because of friendship with God. First, you may hear theological, studying friendship theologically. Why is friendship theological? Well, it's because in Christ, through the covenant of grace, God has transformed, restored, and reformed how we love one another and how we are loved. So first, it's important to define friendship. Today in culture, friendship has been trivialized to a click of a button on Facebook but it's so much more deeper, it's so much more profound. And here are just some three key characteristics of friendship that I hope will serve you well in how to appreciate friendship in Christ and with one another. First, friendship is reciprocal. It's giving and receiving grace. Second, it's mutual, it's sharing, it's fellowship of grace. And third and most importantly, friendship is about holiness. Holiness will determine how you reciprocate and how you fellowship. And above all, look to Christ and his friendship with you as he loves you and as he sanctifies you into his holiness to worship him, serve him, and love him in gratitude. And in scripture, I encourage you to look at such examples of friendship as David and Jonathan, Ruth and Naomi. A negative example in Job's friends ironically called friends, as well as in the New Testament, I encourage you all to look to Philemon. Look how Paul performs the drama of a new and reformed friendship with Onesimus and Philemon. And then I also lastly encourage you to look to great works of literature. Look at Dante and Virgil. Look at Beowulf. Look at Huckleberry Finn. Or of course, look to Tolkien. Consider Sam and Frodo. There's great pictures among literature that perform the drama of new Christian friendship. But above all, remember that when friendships fail, Christ will always be your best and your heavenly friend. I thought you were going to talk about, I have this great white picket fence that's a, a, an opportunity for you to paint from Huck Finn. That's the scene I remember. Thank you for that. That was great. All right, Nathan, you are among us. You've been among us for five years? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. I, I can understand that you might have forgotten those first two and a half. It's okay. So you are fully immersed. Well, you're a Presbyterian, but you're fully immersed in American <laughs> culture. But you still have a bit of an outsider's perspective. Um, what's uniquely challenging for American teenagers with this question of who am I? And you're about to be raising teenagers as well, but what's uniquely American as you think about this as you see it? So it's interesting uh, to think about the differences between Australia and, and the US. Um, before I came here, I assumed that America was just like Australia, except it just had more donuts. Um, <laughs> but there are a lot more differences than that. Uh, I think there are differences politically um, you have um, actual differences in the political system. You have people on the left, people on the right. Australia seems to generally just be in the middle. Um, you have a patriotism that we don't see in Australia. Your founding was very different, so you have a national narrative and story that was, was new to me. Um, and so there are a lot of differences there, but I think when you think of being a teenager, um, our challenges um, are very much the same. I think for each of us here, we would say those teenage years were a time when you're asking, who am I? And you're looking for answers. You're trying to find yourself, as you mentioned in your message this morning. And what has changed today, both in Australia and in the United States, thanks to social media, 
is that we've given a platform to people that really have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, we, we believe that if someone has a platform, it means they're trustworthy and worthy to be listened to. And thanks to social media, we have now given our celebrities, our idols, and things like that, a platform to speak. So someone that may have been a really good actor, or perhaps they were a bad actor, but they're just good looking, so they're in movies, we have suddenly said, let's give you a microphone on social media, and you can tell me how to think about politics, economics, national matters, sexual identity, all of these things, but yet they're not trained or qualified whatsoever. And so young people, you, are hearing these messages every single day from these people that are unqualified. And another thing that's unique to our time is it's not just celebrities and idols, you have this rise of the influencer. So people your own age that have mast masterfully used social media to create their own platforms, and they have a million, two million followers on YouTube, and not only are they not trained in these areas and they're not qualified to give recommendations or advice, they also don't have the maturity or wisdom that perhaps even these actors or singers may just because of the years they've spent on, on Earth. And so you guys are encountering wrong answers to the question of who am I every single day. When we grew up, if we followed some rock singer or something like that, probably the closest we got to encountering them was their picture on a cover to a magazine, maybe an interview in that magazine. But now they're posting videos on Instagram, YouTube, telling you what you should think, who you should vote for, whether religion is important, those kinds of things. Um, so they live in such a confusing, confusing age. And it encourages me that Ligonier Ministries, Reformation Bible College holds an event like this, that you're here wanting to hear the answers to these important eternal questions. Um, and I'm just thankful to be a part of it because what are, what are these people going to hear? What are these young people going to hear Monday to Saturday? Um, if the church is not saying things and using these tools to communicate truth, then you will only be bombarded 24-7 by these unqualified celebrities, influencers, that it's just so easy to just follow their leading. Um, and it's, it's dangerous. Thank you. Those very important points you're making. Thank you. Dr. Tweedale, how is answering the question, who am I, how is that a gospel issue? The question, who am I, is a gospel issue because as a follower of Christ, I am not defined by sin, I'm defined by my relationship to Jesus Christ. Uh, the Reformers, uh, following Augustine, when they thought about the question of humanity and the question of who am I, answered that question in four different ways. Uh, in the first place, they talked about humanity being created in the image of God. So I'm created to know God, I'm created to work for God and to rest in Sabbath, and I'm created to glorify God and to worship Him in covenant. Uh, then they talk about who am I in relationship to the fall. Uh, as a fallen creature, I am morally corrupt by sin, and therefore I deserve death and punishment under God's just condemnation. Uh, then in Christ, I've been renewed, and I'm a person who lives by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. But then ultimately, I'm created for glory. So there's a glorified image. When faith becomes sight, and I'm finally able to be free of sin and worship God as I ought for all eternity. And so the gospel says, I am a renewed and one day glorified sinner. And Christ has redeemed me, so who I am is defined by my relationship to Christ, and then my relationship to Christ informs how I live and why I live as a creature redeemed by the blood of Christ. And Dr. Matheson, in teaching theology, you discuss the image of God. So help us understand what impact Adam's fall or the impact that sin has had on the image of God um, and maybe the impact it didn't have on the image of God. One aspect of the image of God that is important in relation to this question is our rational faculties. I discussed this a little bit in our breakout session earlier. As human beings created in the image of God, 
he has created us rational beings. It's one of the things that distinguishes us from rocks, plants, and, and animals, the lizards outside, the birds, the fish, and so forth. We have rational faculties, the faculty of intellect and will and so forth. And so we can think, we can use our reasoning, we can use these faculties to think about questions. We, we use them to speak, language requires this. The fall affected this. Uh, it affected our mind, it affected our use of this. As fallen creatures, uh, as fallen human beings, we don't always use our rational faculties correctly. Now, when we say that the fall affected this, we have to be very careful not to go to the extreme of saying that the fall annihilated our rational faculties. We were not reduced in the fall to the level of the birds and the lizards and the alligators and so forth outside. We are still human beings, we still have our rational faculties, but because of sin, we, we misuse them. They're, they're distorted by sinful desires, so we let desires for sin affect the way we use our, our reason. It affects, it affects our will as well as our reason. We, we talk about the bondage of the will. There's a bondage of the intellect as well, and it gets, it gets twisted. So although we are created in the image of God and we have this rational faculty, it's been impacted, it's been distorted. We can say it's been shattered, but it has not been completely annihilated. We still can hear the gospel message, understand what is being said, assent to it, trust it, uh, and all of that requires the use of our mind and the use of our reason. Just a, just a point of clarification, if you're thinking about Reformation Bible College, there are actually not alligators right outside the door, just to clarify. They're at a safe distance away. No, that was a very helpful, very helpful answer from all of you. So thank you for that. We're going to switch gears now and have more open-ended questions for you all. Uh, the drive for acceptance or to have that sense of belonging is very strong. When can it go awry? And how do we check it when it does go off course? I'll jump in. Um, that drive for acceptance I think I've been seeing this since the time I first became a Christian, push young Christians and sometimes even older Christians away from the church, away from the Christian faith. There's this twisted desire to be liked by the world and to be considered cool by pagans and unbelievers. And so sometimes what that does is we become ashamed of Christ. We don't want anybody to know we're a Christian. It affects what we'll say. We won't share the gospel. It'll affect our behavior. We start to go along with the crowd and, or at the very least ex start to toy with the idea of accepting behaviors that God's word calls sin. So th this desire to be liked by the world, to be accepted by the world, we need to understand right off the bat that we've been promised by Christ that the world's gonna hate us if we follow him. And you need to be prepared for that from day one. It, and it, it only seems to be getting worse and worse. And there are people today that are being persecuted far, far worse than anything any of us have probably experienced. People right now are risking their lives, their livelihoods around the world. People, Christians throughout history have lost their lives and, and other things for being faithful followers of Christ. We need, we, we need to just count the cost and realize that following Christ is going to mean the hatred of the world. Doesn't mean we reciprocate. We love the lost enough to proclaim the gospel to them and to warn them of the judgment to come and to show them, the, declare to them the means of salvation, but stop worrying about being cool. You have to stop worrying about being acceptable uh, in, in getting these feelings of inferiority. We, God is going to be the victor. Christ is, has already won the victory and will win the victory. And follow him. Be committed to that, come what may. And pray for the grace of the, God, the Holy Spirit, to enable you to walk faithfully. And when you stumble, repent, get back up and, and move forward. This requires also not going it alone. You need to be part of a faithful local church and have faithful friends who will encourage you and pray with and for you as you follow Christ. Choose your friends wisely. I would uh, strongly recommend that. The bad company will lead you astray. These, 
but don't let this become an us versus them thing in the wrong sense. I was a them once. We were all them once. We were all enemies of God, and we are only us now because of the grace of God. And so we look at them with a prayerful, loving attitude and give them the gospel. We need to stop uh, being, you know, we worry about wolves in sheep's clothing. We need to stop being sheep's and wolves' clothing and stop trying to be like the world. We need to be committed, and you need to know as, as young Christians, it's not going to be easy. You are going to be, it's, there's going to be pushback every single day to abandon your faith, to play it down, to not proclaim the gospel, to, to be embarrassed by Christ. You have to pray every single day and be surrounded by other faithful Christians and encourage one another to keep moving forward faithfully and just stop worrying about being cool. I empathize with uh, these young people because they're, you're going through a time where there is an almost objective measure to how accepted you are because you post something on social media, you're watching to see how many likes you get. Um, you're wanting to see how many hearts you get. Uh, I've read people and heard from people that say, you know, if their Instagram post doesn't get a certain number of likes, they delete it. Because how terrifying it would be that anyone noticed that not enough people actually liked and interacted with uh, their, their update. And, and this is something that what we didn't experience. Um, and so they're bombarded with new technology having what they think is an objective metric about how accepted they are, but it really means nothing. Whether you have one like on Facebook or one heart on Instagram or a thousand has no eternal consequence. Uh, and we want to hear from our Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. He's not going to be looking at how many likes and retweets and shares you got on social media. Um, so I empathize with them because this is a constant reminder. I think when we grew up, you just wondered how many people would turn up to your birthday party and that's kind of how you knew how many friends did you have. But today you can just post a picture in the morning and within 30 minutes you think you know how many friends you have. But it's, it's not true. Is gender a social construct? No. I would stop there. You're ahead. <laughs> Do I need to unpack that? Oh, totally. Yes. Elaborate, please. Great. Uh, let me give you two reasons. Uh, gender is not a social construct for a biological reason and then for a theological reason. Uh, in the realm of, of say, natural law, uh, gender is tied to biology. So when we read the Genesis account, we understand God created man and woman, and he created them distinctly, and they have complementarity, they have distinct roles and responsibilities, but male and female have a purpose, and that is to propagate the human race. And so when we divorce uh, gender from biology, we destabilize society. So there's a biological answer to that. However, there's a more fundamental theological answer to that. Uh, we understand when we read uh, the Genesis account, God made man and woman, and he intended for them to come together as one flesh in marriage. And so we learn in Genesis that the man is to leave his father and mother and to cleave to his wife in marriage, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, fast forward to Ephesians 5, and we learn something truly extraordinary. In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 2, and he talks about the mystery of marriage. Now, according to the Apostle Paul, the mystery of marriage is not that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. He actually says the mystery of marriage is this, that, that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and that this speaks to Christ taking for himself a bride here on earth. That is the church. Think about that for a moment. Even before the fall, God instituted uh, marriage to be a picture of the gospel so that the son would leave his father in heaven 
in order to take a bride for himself in the church. And so when we divorce gender uh, from biology and the distinction between man and woman, we actually confuse a central part of the gospel. So marriage is intended to depict the ultimate marriage, which is seen between Christ and the church. And so gender cannot be a social construct for biological and theological reasons. Well, what would you say to someone who might struggle with same-sex attraction? And let me just add this. They might not even feel like they can voice that they have such an attraction. What would you say to them? Well, I'd say in one sense, you know, forgiveness can be found in Christ. Redemption is found in Christ. And in one sense, uh, there's no sin to which we cannot run to Christ for forgiveness. Uh, to trust Him in faith, to ask Him for the power of the Spirit to fight against uh, things like same-sex attraction. Um, we will, but also at the same time, um, that's not to say that we can come to a cavalier kind of approach towards that kind of feeling. We don't want to have a cavalier approach to any kind of sin that we would want to confess uh, to one another, to um, our wives, to our you know, husbands, to our spouses, whatever you're talking to, um, your friends, your, your parents. Um, to not be, you don't want to become comfortable with it because it's something that God uh, condemns and something that God disapproves of. Um, but at the same time, we want to recognize that redemption and forgiveness can be found in Christ. So, so to build off uh, what Dr. Dudrick said, um, so, so dear friend, if you're here today or if you're listening here and you're wrestling with same-sex attraction, uh, or if you, you're wrestling with, with any sin and you fear rejection, that, that is a genuine feeling. It's paralyzing. And what the gospel says to you is that Christ accepts all who come to him in faith and repentance. He accepts anyone who comes to him in faith and repentance. But he only accepts those who come to him in faith and repentance. So take your faith your fear, your anxieties, your sins, your struggles, and bring them to Christ before they ruin your life. So don't fear rejection from Christ because he has never rejected anyone who comes to him by faith. So bring your sin to him, and he has power to transform your life. Now, it may take the rest of your life, and you may not be free from that until glory but he will give grace and the power of the gospel can transform your life. So Christ will not reject you. And then as a result of that, those of us who are in Christ open our arms to you. A gospel-centered local church is going to open their arms to you in the name of Christ. So as Christ gives you open arms in the gospel, a gospel-centered church is going to give you open arms in the gospel. So bring your struggles and your sin to your pastor, to a youth pastor, to, to an elder, to a godly Christian friend. So don't fear rejection from Christ, and then don't fear rejection from the church. So if you're here today, you know, please uh, go immediately to a friend or to a pastor and start opening up. But more importantly, take that then to Christ. Sort of thinking along those lines of forgiveness and redemption that we have, what if someone can't seem to feel forgiven? What if they just feel guilty and overwhelmed by guilt? What would you say to that person? Well, to this person, it is a work of the Holy Spirit, conviction of our sin. 
through the knowledge of sin revealed through the law of God. So the guilt is real. We all are sinners and knowing our misery as sinners, knowing our guilt before the holiness of God is only a beginning though for Christians. It's for this Christian and to you dear Christian if you're struggling with guilt now or struggling with feeling that you're forgiven, I will immediately point you to Christ, especially encourage you to read, to reread, to meditate upon 1 John. Throughout that letter, you'll see a phrase, by this we know. By this you will know. And at the heart of the letter, you will know that you have the assurance that you are forgiven if you believe in Christ. But it's not dependent on the strength of your faith. It is because of the certainty of the person and work of Christ. Christ is your assurance. So if you struggle, look to Christ. And knowing Christ, trusting Christ, you will be assured that you have eternal life, that he is your advocate, that he is faithful and just to forgive all of our sins, past, present, and future. So continue to Meditate upon the law to know our misery so that we may know the, our glorious deliverance in Christ and that will engender within us a gratitude to live gratefully before him for his deliverance from the power and presence of sin. So I encourage you to read the Heidelberg Catechism. That is the structure of it. To know our misery through the law so that it would point us to our glorious deliverance in Christ and then to look to the law sweetly to live by faith performing good works for his glory and gratitude. You know, there's a uh, text by, we'll go out of the Heidelberg Catechism for a moment, Professor. There's a text by Jonathan Edwards. There was a young lady in a church where Edwards went, preached, and there was a revival there, and the church was without a pastor. She wrote a letter to Edwards basically asking her, how do I live the Christ asking him rather, how do I live the Christian life? And this is a very busy time in Edward's life, and he went into his study, and he wrote this massive letter back to her, giving her advice. And it got published and distributed, and it came to be known as Advice to a Young Convert, also known as the letter to Deborah Hathaway. She was just a young teenager. And in there, he says, um, never think lowly enough of yourself for your sins. R recognize your sins. Don't try to justify them or rationalize them or ignore them. So recognize your sin. But then he says this in the very next paragraph. But then realize this, that Christ's grace and mercy infinitely overtops the highest mountain of your sin. So you have this perspective of yourself and your sin and then this great expression, infinitely overtopping that, is Christ's grace. Uh, it was also interesting talking with us about, uh, from Eric Beckman, works over at the college. He remembers from an RC video where RC would say, he was engaged in different people of religions, and they'd talk about different theological debates. And RC would always try to cut to the chase with these people. And he would say, but what do you do with guilt? How does your religion help you deal with guilt. And it's a way, really, to point to the gospel and point to the uniqueness of Christ and the triumph of the gospel uh, to deal with this question of uh, guilt as we come to Christ and as we live in Christ. It seems that the evidence is overwhelming for biological evolution. What's the big deal? at admitting a little bit of evolution into our thinking of origins. I would uh, say we're told that the evidence for biological evolution, for macroevolution is overwhelming. Um, and it's because we're being told that and inundated with that that it seems like that's the case. But I think we need to take a step back and ask whether what we're being told and what we're being hit with all the time on social media, on the news and books is actually the case. Part of what we have to keep in mind is the gatekeepers. Uh, if you want to study biology in almost any major university, 
all of, or if you want to get tenure, or if you want to teach, if you want to write, you have to toe the line. And anybody who steps outside that line is going to be ostracized, probably not receive tenure, and end up working at a local bookstore. This is not an easy world for, uh, for anyone who is not willing to toe the line to live in. So we, we get this all the time. And let me, I can share my own experience with this. I was not raised in a Christian family, and so I wasn't raised in church and did not hear anything outside the, the mainstream view while I was in high school, and this was 30 plus years ago. So I came out of high school just assuming, because of what I was told, that the evidence for evolution is conclusive. And so when I became a Christian a year or so after high school, I was coming into Christianity as one who just thought, this is the way it is. And at the time, it didn't really occur to me to think about that issue much. A couple of years later, um, I'm in college and being told that evolution is the way God did these things. It's the way he created then got more established in a church and was told, you know, evolution contradicts scripture. And at that point, I really had to start thinking about this and start, started to do some reading. And it's over the last 30 years, all this reading, finding out that uh, the evidence out there is, is not as overwhelming as it's portrayed to be. And so I, I think the first thing we need to do as, as Christians is stop cowering in, in fear of, of, of what these people are saying. It does impact elements of our theology, and we need to think about those, particularly Darwinian evolution, where we're told that th there's this meaningless, mindless process that happens purely on the basis of natural selection and, and genetic mutations and so forth. That kind of thing is completely contrary to Christianity because it rules out God and providence entirely. Uh, there are also elements related to the who am I question. Am I just a, an animal with no purpose and no meaning in life? There's a lot of people today acting on that, a lot of young people acting on that. They are being fed this idea over and over daily that there is no God, there is no purpose, you're just an animal, survival of the fittest, there's no hope for the future, and we act surprised when somebody picks up a gun and, and, and goes and kills themselves or somebody else because they're being told something that is contrary to what they really are as a creature of God, and it leads to despair, uh, that hopeless despair when we have no purpose and we're just going to die like any other animal. And I go back again to the doctrine of Christ. Christ is truly God and truly man. And being a human being is different from being a, an, an animal. Christ is, is not just, his human nature is not just a highly evolved um, monkey. It, he is truly a human being and distinct from uh, animals, plants, rocks, other creatures of God. So, Go and, and if this issue is one that's troubling you, go and do more reading. Don't just buy into the, what's being force-fed us every day on, on news and social media. Go and, and do some research, and you, you can find out that there are, there's a lot going on even today, and, and, and there's doubters out there. A lot of doubters, even PhD scientists, don't want to let that doubt be known because they're embarrassed, and they don't want to be persecuted, and they want to keep their job. And at the universities, and so it's difficult for them to let that be known. But there are people writing uh, on this subject, and there are serious, serious problems with the case for uh, biological micro, macro evolution. So do some research. I, I, I can't list everything from up here that I would suggest, but they're, they're, the works are out there by competent PhD level scientists. And I would just add to that is that it's not just a, it's, it's just, it's that, it's even more in terms of not simply being truthful about what does the Bible say about human origins in Genesis, but it's, if Adam is not a real human being, if he's just a metaphor, if he's just a part of ancient cosmology, then in what sense is Christ the last Adam, right? If Adam is a metaphorical human being, then Christ is a metaphorical human savior. And so we have to reconfigure completely what we, what we believe about sin, what we believe about salvation and grace, 
if we can no longer understand Adam as that whom we're in if we're not in Christ. Because either we're in Adam or we're in Christ. And we can only understand the truth and the reality and the blessings of being in Christ if we understand the complete depravity we are in, in Adam. A, a tremendous amount is at stake in this question of the historical Adam and biological evolution. Well, thank you to all of you, but we have one last question, and we're just going to let the non-RBC faculty member answer because you've been so gracious to join us, Nathan. So, Nathan, if you could write a few lines of advice to your teenage self on personal identity, what would those lines be? First, I'll say stop tweeting. Um, I don't really believe that. Uh, I think the path forward is for us to grow in wisdom and how to use technology well and in a, in a godly way. Uh, but in my teenage years, I did not grow up in a Christian home like Dr. Matheson. And uh, I am just thankful that I wasn't growing up in 2019 and that everything I thought, everything I questioned, everything I struggled with, I'm just so glad it hasn't been documented on a Facebook page or an Instagram account or Google search history. Um, so my advice to my, my teenage self um, would be to turn to the Word of God and uh, particularly to turn to the Gospels and to read them and seek to know the answer to the question, who is Christ and what does He say to me, and then to repent and to trust in Him. My only regret is that I did not begin following Christ more seriously earlier in my teenage years. It was after high school, early college years that I became a Christian, and I had many, many opportunities. Um, and I wish that if it were in my power, which being theologically more astute now, I know it wasn't, um, I wish I could go back and have lived those teenage years as a, as a godly young man. Could you give the panel your appreciation for this time? Thank you.